Have you ever wondered why, when you're travelling on a roundabout in a car, you feel yourself being pushed up against the door? Why, when you frequent the local fair and shoot your friend on the merry-go-round with an arrow, it appears to take a curved path? Perhaps even, you have felt a seatbelt crush your chest as your parent who can't drive suddenly breaks to avoid a dog. All these mythical phenomena can be explained with fictitious forces. Before delving into the mysterious world of fictitious forces, we must understand frames of reference, which are simply the regions of space around us that we use to measure motion of objects relative to. Inertial frames are those that move at a constant velocity or remain stationary, and the frames for which Newton's laws of motion are valid. Non-inertial frames, on the other hand, are frames that are accelerating with respect to inertial frames and where Newton's laws of motion are not valid. Imagine you're in front of a truck with a pendulum stuck to its ceiling, you're on an inertial frame of reference as the floor is stationary. As the truck begins to accelerate to the right, you understand that the pendulum will swing left, because according to the law of inertia, the pendulum will try to maintain its zero velocity since no real net force is acting on it. With Donald Trump standing inside the truck, however, the pendulum appears to swing to the left. Being a true fan of Newton's first law, he realises there must be a great, very great force acting on the pendulum because it changed velocity. As usual, Trump is hallucinating. There is no real force, simply the result of inertia as the truck accelerates. Trump mistakes this for a force because he is inside the non-inertial frame where Newton's laws are not valid and so objects can spontaneously change velocity without a non-zero net force acting on them. We will now take a look at inertial rotating frames. Let's begin with the ball rotating on a frictionless horizontal plane as it's attached to the centre by a string. An observer in the inertial frame sees an inwardly directed force keeping the ball in circular motion which is the centrifugal force provided by the tension in the string, which is given by the equation F equals mv squared over r, which we are familiar with. However, when we start to look at rotations in a non-inertial frame, things are slightly different. Now, if we look at the observer in the non-inertial frame by imagining a person inside the rotating object, the observer will see the object rotating at rest. Qualitatively, this means as there's a force acting on the object towards the centre of the circle, there must also be an equal force acting radially outwards. This fictitious force is known as the centrifugal force and arises because of the frame's rotation. Let's imagine that you are sitting on a merry-go-round rotating around the omega hat axis, our distance from that axis, and with angular displacement theta. We can treat these three unit vectors as orthogonal, i, j, k vectors we are familiar with, and apply similar rules of the cross product to them. For an outside observer, we can deduce your position as well as its change over time using polar coordinates. By using this method, we can arrive at results for what d omega hat dt and d theta hat dt. We will use those equations later, but for now, let's look at your change of position when sitting on the merry-go-round, in your perspective. Notice when differentiating your position, we'd get one term which is your velocity with respect to the rotating frame, and in this case, it is zero since you are sitting. Using results we have obtained from above equations 1 and 2, we can obtain your change of position. If we differentiate again to obtain the second derivative of your position, which is acceleration, we would get omega cross omega cross r. Using the right hand rule, we could find out that the acceleration points towards the centre of the merry-go-round. Sounds familiar? Yes. This is a central petal force, and the only one that the outside observer could see. But then, why is it that in your perspective you are not moving, despite the centripetal force, in this case friction, pulling you inwards? That is because of the centrifugal force arises in your perspective only, and its magnitude is equal to that of the centripetal force as well as direction pointing radially outwards. There is one other fictitious force that also has a profound effect on our everyday lives and it's called the Coriolis force, which arises when an object in a non-inertial frame is moving. So consider this point particle called P. As P starts to rotate about the origin with angular velocity omega in the counterclockwise direction, it also starts to move in the positive radial direction with a velocity v. In the inertial frame, the tangential velocity at distance r1 from the origin will be omega r1. As the particle is moving outwards, the radial velocity v is still the same, but at the later time, when the particle is further away at distance r2 from the origin, the tangential velocity is higher in order to maintain the angular velocity. There must be a force, known as the restraining force, acting in the tangential direction as the particle is accelerating along this direction, which is needed to maintain the particle's circular outward motion. In the non-inertial frame, where you are the rotating particle and the frame is rotating with you, if the restraining force is present, you will see yourself travelling in a straight line. This means that, as you see yourself in equilibrium along the horizontal direction, there must also be a force acting on you in the opposite direction, which is the Coriolis force. If we now were to remove the restraining force, the particle no longer sees itself in tangential equilibrium and has a net force acting to the right. This gives rise to the rightward curve of the arrow in the beginning of the video as seen by an observer in the merry-go-round. You might already be asking yourself, since we are living in a non-inertial rotating frame of reference all the time, shouldn't we see the effects of the Coriolis force? So consider this. 
Let's start with the Earth rotating in an anti-clockwise direction with angular velocity omega. Donald Trump is in Antarctica conducting research to fight climate change and decides to send his data to a colleague in Ecuador. He sends the data with velocity which would be the vector sum of the vertical velocity and the tangential velocity due to the Earth's rotation. But Ecuador, being at the equator, rotates with a greater tangential velocity than Antarctica and so by the time the data arrives, Ecuador is now at point B. According to an observer in the non-inertial frame, the Coriolis force has displaced the data to the left. But there is no real force, it is only an effect caused by Ecuador rotating faster than Antarctica. By using a similar example, we could show that the data would be deflected to the right in the northern hemisphere, which explains why the shells from the Paris gun in World War I always fell around 1,300 meters right of the original target. Or as Lisa puts it, In the northern hemisphere, water always drains counterclockwise. 